church, we have had church up in here this morning. The minister has been ministered to. So if I wasn't ready, which God has readied me, I am now ready. Join me for the remainder of church this morning. Let's give it up for God. You know, you sit here and you wonder sometimes when you prepare a sermon what God has in store for his people. And every time I've stood before you, I've had confirmation before I stood up to deliver the sermon. I hope you listen to the words that you were ministered to today. My sister said, there's no turning back. My sister prophesied to us, there is no turning back. First, giving honor and praise to my God and Jesus Christ, my Savior, for allowing me to stand before you this morning and to bring you the word of life. To Dr. Waller, the angel of First African Baptist Church, for his dedication and commitment to the members of this church and this community by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. For we know there is no other than the gospel of Jesus Christ. To the deacons, deaconess, trustees, associate ministers, and to the congregation, I stand before you with thanksgiving this morning for your dedication, your service, and your desire to do kingdom building. May we pray. Heavenly Father, you have poured into me. Allow me to pour out that which you have poured into me. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, that we might receive this word, that we might understand this word, that we might accept this word and that we might live this word in the name of our Son, of your Son and our Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. It's customary for me to always bring you some words of wisdom anytime I take the pulpit. So Deacon Barham, I just want you all to know there is a fine line. Can you say fine line? There is a fine line. There's a fine line. Can you say fine line? Between a long drawn out sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> So I have people that will let me know when they feel hostage. <laughs> this morning, if you would, the scripture is going to be coming from Luke 9, New Testament reading, verse 51 and 57 through 62. When you have it, say amen. Amen. 
As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Verse 57, as they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you. I will follow you, Lord. But first, let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. You may be seated. This morning, I'd like to share a brief story with you. Several years ago, a preacher from out of state accepted a call to a church in Houston, Texas. Some weeks after he arrived, he had an occasion to ride the bus from his home to the downtown area. When he sat down, he discovered that the driver had accidentally given him a quarter too much change. As he considered what to do, he thought to himself, you better give the quarter back. It would be wrong to keep it. Then he thought, oh, forget it. It's only a quarter. Who would worry about such a little amount of money? He reasoned that the bus company gets too much fare anyway and that they will never miss it. Accept it as a gift from God and keep quiet. When a stop came, he paused momentarily at the door and then he handed the quarter to the driver and said, Here, you gave me too much change. Yes, the bus driver replied. You know, I have been thinking a lot lately about going somewhere to worship. I just wanted to see what you would do if I gave you too much change. I'll see you on Sunday in church. When the preacher stepped off the bus, he literally grabbed the nearest light pole, held on, and said, Oh, God, I almost sold your son for a quarter. You see, church, our lives are the only Bible some people will ever read. This is just an example of how much people watch Christians and will put us to the test. Always be on guard and remember, we carry the name of Christ on our shoulders when we call ourselves a Christian. The title this morning is The Cost of following Jesus. The cost of following Jesus. Looking to the text this morning, we find Jesus and his disciples are en route to Jerusalem so that Jesus can fulfill the things that have been written about him. The words in verse 51, taken up to heaven, clearly refers to Jesus' ascension, 
but it also refers to all that will happen in Jerusalem, including Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. Jesus encounters not one, not two, but three men on his travels that indicate a desire to be a follower of his. Three men, each with a different level of commitment, and each one receives a different response. So I want to ask you this morning, church, what is the difference between a Christian and a disciple? Don't get quiet on me now. What is the difference in a Christian and a disciple? The term Christian and disciple are related but not synonymous. A Christian is someone who has placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. They have been born again by the power of the Holy Spirit. A Christian belongs to Christ and, his daily, and is daily being transformed into the likeness of Christ. A disciple is a follower, someone who adheres completely to the teaching of Jesus and making them his rule of life and conduct. The Greek term for disciple in the New Testament is methetos. Methetos, which means more than just a student or learner. A true Christian, meaning belonging to Christ, will have to be a disciple of Christ as well. Discipleship requires trusting God in the midst of rejection. Can you say that, church? Discipleship requires trusting God in the midst of rejection. So you ask, what does that mean, Minister Cat? Isn't it enough just to be a Christian? Well, I'm glad you asked. The call is to go and proclaim the kingdom. The ministry of proclamation is not limited to just a few. A disciple's ministry is one of proclamation and service. We are to serve God in dependence, resting in provision. Yes, Jesus had an inner circle. But the call of the ministry was not theirs alone. Disciples are called to preach hope of the kingdom. This is a responsibility. This is a responsibility of all disciples. We live in an age when marketing and public strategies often determine how the gospel is shared. The gospel is not a consumer-oriented product. To be a disciple means one has counted the cost and has totally committed his life to following Jesus. One accepts the call to sacrifice and follows wherever the Lord leads. Now see, y'all done gotten too quiet up in here for me today. I use the word sacrifice, follow, and leads. And some of you have already left me in the sermon. Christ is your number one priority, and you will be actively involved in making other Christians disciples. I can't find one place in scripture where Jesus ever used the term Christian. But I can find where he used the term disciple. Can we say we're working on getting it right? I need some sincerity. 
we're working on getting it right. Jesus never commanded in the Gospel of Matthew in the Great Commission to go out and make Christians, but he commanded to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. This commission is not a suggestion. It is a command. The cost of following Jesus. You see, my brothers and sisters, our salvation is free, but discipleship will cost you your life. That's right. You heard me correctly. Salvation is free. But discipleship will cost us our lives. This means to be a disciple of Jesus, we have to give up our lives in order to follow him. Our lives are no longer our own. Our lives belong to Jesus. Earlier in Luke, 9 verse 23 through 26 Jesus puts it bluntly and to the point he said whosoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me for whoever wants to save their life will lose it but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose, and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whosoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes, when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. No one, no one church can follow Jesus without making him the absolute and exclusive center of life. Even though these people had been privy to the miracles of Jesus, the miracles he performed, and to his teaching, they still refused to submit themselves to the kingdom message. Now I want to share with you a few things that discipleship isn't. Discipleship isn't just me and Jesus. Discipleship is not just me and Jesus. While discipleship is all about Jesus, it is not a solitary endeavor. Discipleship is relational. Mm. Discipleship is relational. And we need to become disciples who are, who are making disciples of Jesus the Christ. You ask, how do we do that, Minister Cat? We become relational by spending consistent time with other believers. Did not Jesus spend a great deal of time with the 12 disciples? If memory serves me correctly, they ate together. They slept together. They walked together. They rode in boats together. And yes, they even fought together. Amen, somebody. These 12 disciples were not only constantly, but they were intentionally in one another's lives. Now, I don't like to be the bearer of bad news, church. But I must share with you 
that our five minute Sunday morning welcome and greeting does not constitute spending time together the way Jesus wants us to. Well, 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 we have to be good. We have to go beyond that five minutes. While we are called to become disciples of Jesus, we also become disciples with one another. Learning how to love God and one another. We need one another in this journey, church, of becoming disciples. The cost of following Jesus. Discipleship isn't mentoring. Mentoring has to do with what the mentor can offer to someone else through their own wisdom and experience. Discipleship has to do with what Jesus can offer someone else through his wisdom and his presence. Discipleship isn't a method. To become a disciple of Jesus, you're not required to attend a certain church, nor does it require participating in a certain Bible study. And it doesn't require you to pray a certain way. But I want you to go back and tell pastor that I suggested First African Baptist Church, where you can grow in grace. Just as the 12 disciples were sent by Jesus to cast out demons, heal the sick, proclaim the good news and the gospel that the kingdom of God is near, people, that responsibility has not changed for us. We are still required to do kingdom things. Jesus was a sojourner and a non-resident alien. And from time to time, people would come up alongside of him and engage in conversation, just as we see in these scriptures this morning. In verse 58, a man approaches. He says, I will follow you wherever you go in 57. And Jesus responds, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Jesus' response was not encouraging. Jesus had already left his own home, his own family in Nazareth, to carry out his mission. In his journey, he only stayed for short periods of time and then continued to travel, never knowing where he was going to be laying his head or where his next meal would be coming from. His life involved setting his face toward Jerusalem and not turning. Here, a man says to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go, not realizing that Jesus was on his way to Golgotha. I'll call him the opportunist. I want you to take notice that Jesus doesn't reject this man or turn him away. Instead, Jesus warns him of the cost and sacrifice involved in following him. Certainly, this man had heard the teachings and seen the miracles of Jesus. However, this man is more interested in what he can get out of the relationship than what he can offer the relationship. He expects an easy life by following Jesus. Jesus all throughout scripture lets us know that the world is not his home and he is just passing through. His was not a life of luxury. Many of us 
think that following Jesus should be easy. We want our Christianity to be like that as well, don't we? We say we are ready to run the race. We say we are eager to count the cost. We say we are prepared to suffer. We say we are willing to carry the cross. But are we really ready? Are we really ready, church? Following Jesus can be hard. There is a cost involved. This is a truth we need to understand and consider. Matthew 19, verse 29, there is a promise of God. And everyone who has left houses or brethren, or sisters, or father, or mother, or wife, or children, or lands, for my sake, shall receive a hundredfold, and shall receive and inherit eternal life. That should have been an amen from somebody in here even if it's from me. In verse 59, Jesus looks at a man and says only two words. Two words. Follow me. The man replies, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. I'll call him the hesitator. This man does not say his father has just died, people. In the culture of the day, when a person died, they were buried the same day. They did not wait around. When death presented itself, they moved quickly. In Judaism, Burying family members is a priority. If that had been the case, would the man not be at home making preparation for his family's funeral instead of being in the company of Jesus? In all probability, the father was not even sick, lest the son be by his side. The man's response is one of which I believe to be that he has responsibilities to his father as long as his father lives. He is not free right now to follow Jesus, but when his father dies, then he'll be ready right away. Jesus told the man to let the dead bury the dead and for him to go and proclaim the kingdom of God Jesus is speaking figuratively here of the spiritually dead those who have put off following Jesus it's the spiritually alive that are being called to follow Jesus Jesus is saying in the strongest possible way that following him must come, must come before every responsibility we have. We do not choose when to follow Jesus. Discipleship is a now thing. It is immediate. No excuse we can offer is adequate to put on hold Jesus' compelling summons. Now, if you think the first two people had met a hard response, let's take a look at the third person in the story. Verse 61. I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. The man just wants to go and say goodbye to his family. And then he will follow Jesus. That's all. What's wrong with that? 
I'll call him the procrastinator. Maybe I can help you understand this way. It's like a man who's been drafted into the military. He says he'll report for duty in a week, but first he needs to go home and say goodbye to his girlfriend, his buddies, his mom, his dad, his sisters, his brothers, and we might as well throw in a going away party because he's going to be gone for a while. One could ask, is he really ready for the army or is he looking to his own needs and desires? Brothers and sisters, this would become a defining moment in this man's life in scripture. His decision would determine the road he would travel. Now in my studying and research, I found out that whether your plow is pulled by a mule, a workhorse, or a diesel tractor, there is one no-no. Just one no-no. You never plow looking over your shoulder. And I'm a city girl. If you do, your rows are crooked and the field is difficult to work. Plowmen fix their eyes on a point at the far end of the field and move steadily toward it, not veering to the right side nor to the left. To put your hand to the plow means to begin the task of plowing. God allows us to glance back, church. But what Jesus is saying, you can't continue to look back once you've begun to plow. Let me ask you something. Have you ever tried mowing your lawn looking back? Or better yet, mowing your lawn in reverse. The results are not going to be good. This can happen in our Christian life. We can look back thinking others are having more fun. We can look back thinking others are having more freedom. We can look back and think somehow we are missing out. We can look back thinking others don't have to give up so much. We can look back thinking we are making a greater sacrifice. The cost of following Jesus. Now I'm looking at some of you this morning and you're probably asking, what right does Jesus have to command such a sacrifice? and instant obedience. Church critics of Christianity have accused Jesus of being abrasive, insensitive, and unbearably egotistically based on the scriptures that we are dealing with today. But brothers and sisters, if Jesus is the only way to the Father, I need some affirmation in this house. If Jesus is the only way to the Father, doesn't he have a right to ask us for total commitment? Doesn't he have the right to decide if we are fit for service for the kingdom of God? Jesus must be first in our lives at all times. Dear friends, dear friends, my dear, dear friends, yes, I agree, Jesus has the right because he is the king of Jews who laid down his life for you and me. Jesus is the creator of the universe and the creator of you and me. 
Jesus is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. Jesus holds the key to death and hell. Jesus is the conqueror and overcomer. Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is risen. Jesus is a bright and morning star. Jesus' name is higher than any other name. Glory! He is the one and only true living God. In closing, he still humbles himself to come looking for us and to speak to us. Do you hear him calling? Is he knocking on your door? What could possibly be more important right now than going immediately to the door and opening it so Jesus can come in? You see, some of us have accepted the free gift of Christianity, becoming the Christian. But not all have accepted the call to discipleship. I pray this morning that if God is talking to you, that you listen, because he's pricking your heart. There's more to do. There's more to do, church. If you please stand this morning. If you are here this morning, I'd like to render the invitation to come to Jesus and to become his disciple. We are inviting you to be in a committed, a committed relationship with God the Father through the blood of Jesus Christ. We would ask you this morning to come quickly. Come quickly. Don't let anyone hold you back. I told you to be a Christian means you have to be a disciple as well. But maybe you haven't accepted that. The cost is high. It will cost you your life. Salvation was free. But discipleship will cost you. Is there anyone here? that is ready to accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior this morning. I've talked to you this morning about three persons who could not or would not go and follow Jesus.